Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, today I am here with Disabled American Veterans Executive Director Randy Reese to talk about VA's response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and how we can care for our veterans throughout this crisis. Uh, I want to thank the DAV uh, and your auxiliary members. We're grateful to have you with us, even though it's just virtually. So uh, be better if it was in person, but you know, circumstances warrant that we remain safe. Um, I want to give you a brief update um, uh, that on Tuesday, uh, President Trump signed HR 6322, my bipartisan Student Veteran Coronavirus Response Act of 2020 into law. Uh, that was a big win for our student veterans, and I'm grateful for the DAV's support of that legislation. Um, currently, we're getting daily slide decks from the VA with facility level data on the number of veterans and employees who have been tested, how many of those uh, are positive, uh, and what the uh, bed occupancy rates are, what the what the uh, supply of C PPE is. And sadly, the number of veterans and VA staff who have died as a result of COVID-19. Um, uh, I just got a report yesterday from my own local uh, Loma Linda VA that an employee uh, who was, I think, 60, 64 years of age uh, uh, passed away uh, after having been, having been tested positive uh, some two or three weeks ago. Um, we've also had weekly calls with both the Secretary and Dr. Stone related to the department's response to COVID-19. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, Randy, uh, we're pressing for more transparency throughout the crisis. Uh, what is most important now is that uh, we know what VA needs uh, to keep their staff and veteran patients safe. And that's why I wanted to talk with you today uh, to see how it is we can help and see how things are going. Um, first off, you're doing okay? So far, so good. Um, definitely uh, different to make the uh, transformation to teleworking from home. And uh, the whole DAV team is teleworking from home, but we're all engaged and we're still taking care of business, taking veteran calls and dealing with them online to include the entire claims process and appeals. That's wonderful to hear. Um, and your team is okay for the most part. I. I've, I've kept both my Washington staff, my DC, uh, my district staff, uh, they're teleworking as well. And we, we started that fairly early, but your team is okay too? Team is doing great. And I gotta tell you, great compliments to the uh, initiative taken by your staff and especially the first teleconference we had and now doing this virtually along with some of your virtual round table that you had about homeless veterans. Kudos to everybody on the House Veterans Affairs Committee. Well, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. I really do. Um, but it was the first one, you know. I was just on one today. We're kind of proud of the fact that we were the first out of the gate. And leave it to the Veterans Affairs Committee with its tradition of bipartisanship uh, that we got both sides to participate. So uh, and we appreciate that feedback. Um, so what are you hearing from your membership? Um, what seems to be their top concerns at this point? Well, top concerns, as you can, you can imagine, with 20% or one in five of the deaths so far reported being from the veterans population is health. Um, a lot of veterans have a lot of chronic underlying illnesses, concerns, and just being able to engage in daily activities is a great concern. And then, of course, behind that is the increased stress and financial resilience as to whether they'll be able to recover after the disaster is over. Yeah, uh, you know, um, our Dr. Stone, who is the executive in charge of the Veterans Health Administration, you know, uh, talked about that our veteran population that we serve in the VA trends older, uh, precisely in that most vulnerable age, and they have a lot of chronic conditions, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, they're whether you're talking about Agent Orange or you're talking about any number of complications that veterans have, they, they're older, they trend male, and um, you know, uh, they, they, they have those complex underlying conditions which make them extra vulnerable uh, to uh, um, 
uh, to infection and its complications. Um, and I was just on with the PVA before I was talking to you uh, today, uh, but they noted that VA has, has had a success in terms of, uh, of having a very, a very low rate of infection at the community living centers uh, and at the, uh, uh, the, the spinal injury centers that they have. Uh, and I know that the VA put a lot of attention on that early. They shut down visitations. Uh, they more recently, uh, I think they have done more intensive testing um, at those sites. And it only goes to show that we, we need that ramping up of testing generally. I, I'd love to know that we can frequently test all of our employees uh, and that we could do that with the veteran population. Uh, all of America, really, we, I think we could use that. From, uh, use that. Um, um, uh, anything else come to mind you're hearing from your members uh, beyond those things that you mentioned so far? Well, I think mental health is a significant challenge. Uh, when we talk about health care, sometimes we, we categorize that as chronic ailments and, you know, mental health has a significance within the veterans population on any given day, but then you add the constraints of being isolated, financial distress, it really wears hope down very quickly. So mental health is probably at the pinnacle of concern for DAV and our members. I'll probably mention this again, but let's take a moment now to uh, plug the Veterans Crisis Line, which is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, that number uh, is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. Select option one, or you can text 838-255. That's 838-255. I mentioned that because um, uh, what you just said, that uh, veterans are, are feeling extra stress. I know that the VA has been doing more outreach to those veterans they think are at risk, uh, but they yeah. may not find everybody. So, um, and, so that you want to say something about that, that they have the, you've, you've, you've noticed that, uh, that outreach they, to the VA? They absolutely have. As a, as a user of the VA system myself, um, I get text messages quite frequently. And some of those text messages about resources for mental health. Uh, in, in addition to that, you know, they've actually done a great job of following up and reaching out just to make sure that the social interaction, if you want to call it a buddy check, is going on. They're even doing peer groups through telemedicine. So um, anytime that you can have group therapy going on, uh, I, I don't think that VA in the, the world of mental health and as fast as we've moved in the last six weeks, going from face to face to telemedicine, they haven't missed a beat. So very, very proud of the resilience of the VA and being able to keep pace. Yeah, you know, the VA takes so many hits and my job as a chairman is to, is to be a watchdog and oversight. But, you know, I also want to make sure that we never give the misimpression that the VA is broken, uh, that it offers great care and especially mental health care. And um, so it's important while we want to be uh, critics and we want them to be better uh, that we give them a pat on the back when they get things right. And so um, I'm hearing that they've been doing the outreach uh, on a mental health basis. And um, I am, uh, you know, proud of the fact that the, of the long-term, the community living centers, the long-term care facilities where we have inpatient, uh, you know, uh, resident, we have inpatient care. Uh, and a lot of those folks are probably your members, uh, that, um, that they've been able to keep them for the most part safe from the virus. They've tried to keep them sequestered from other parts of the hospital, that they've been instituting internal policies. Uh, we have seen state veterans homes not be so lucky. And the VA does not directly run those. They fund them, but they don't directly run them. And, and in a few couple of states, we've had some tragic uh, collapses in care. And, uh, and we have a lot of veterans that um, are staying in private nursing homes. And so I know the VA has been reaching out to many of the governors, uh, the many states out there to find out where our veterans are in these private nursing homes. And under the fourth mission, they're even like using, they're, they're being proactive. They're trying to go out and find 
nursing homes, which may be under collapse, they're going to say, well, you have a veteran there, we'll, we'll offer to come test them, take them to our facility if we need to. Uh, but we can also, since we are, since the VA is an expert in uh, taking care of older people, uh, they have a lot of advice to give and expertise to give to these private nursing homes that are overwhelmed. They've just been overwhelmed. Absolutely. You know, I, I think the last report that the secretary gave uh, this last Wednesday indicated that they had taken the initiative in 33 states uh, to engage with the governors and with local municipalities to go and check on veterans in those nursing homes. And sometimes, you know, they're sending in a strike team to give an actual helping hand. Other times it's giving them PPE, but certainly exceeding the expectations of the average bear when it comes down to those nursing homes. And VA has probably set the standard, if you wanna call it, if we, after this is over, do an after action review. The new rule book could be, we take care of not only the, the CLCs of the Department of Veterans Affairs, but we get a little more proactive with the state and those other municipalities that has veteran homes. Yeah, um, the, you know, the after, we don't wanna get, I don't wanna make this about after action, but, um, Let's flag that for, I, I know you're gonna flag it. Uh, uh, Dr. Stone has is, is, is mentioned to me, uh, and he wasn't trying to be critical of FEMA, because FEMA has to do its, you know, things aren't gonna run smooth and we're putting together, the government's trying to get its act together in real time. Uh, but uh, the VA may, that may need to have its own stockpile. Uh, and we're gonna have to think about that stockpile, not just for our first mission, but we're gonna to have to think about that stockpile for our fourth mission, which would include veterans and state homes. Uh, uh, and uh, we're gonna to have to think about how VA fits into a national pandemic response. Uh, but we, we're definitely gonna to need uh, to be masters of our own fate in terms of having our own stockpile of, of PPE and uh, other vital supplies. Um, you know, this, well, this isn't a new concern after 9-11. Uh, the IB, the VFW, Paralyzed Veterans of America, and DAV, in our independent budget, we put out, you know, some critical concerns that the necessary fourth mission preparations wasn't being quite up to par. And unfortunately, even under these circumstances, while it's a once in a hundred year predicament, we could be at war too and have a fourth mission back up to an ongoing war scenario simultaneous with a pandemic. And so, while we look at this as a worst case scenario, it could actually be much worse. Yes, well, we, we were down in Puerto Rico uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Uh, and um, we, uh, I don't think anybody anticipated that an entire island, that the entire island would be uh, out of commission and out of commission for longer than we thought. So we were talking way back in August of last year uh, about, the need to rethink um, our, our caches of supply and disaster preparedness, not just in terms of what's driven the fourth mission, uh, but what is what concerns that driven the fourth mission in history. Uh, and initially nuclear attack, uh, anthrax, you know, terrorism, uh, but that we were encouraging the VA to take seriously um, national disasters. And I, it's pretty clear that we have not we weren't really thinking in terms of pandemic, how VA would fit, and it's it goes beyond the VA. So, um, uh, and I was aware that there was a revisiting after 9/11, uh, uh, and that quite a bit of law was changed. Uh, apparently, the whole national stockpile idea kind of began with President Clinton reading a, th a thriller novel, uh, and it was he got so concerned and scared by what he read in this book that he said, "We got to create a national stockpile." And then 9-11 uh, happens, and then there was rethinking then. And um, so Dr. Stone has mentioned that we, we need to go back and think about how VA fits into the fourth mission. And I think, we, I think we're gonna redefine the fourth mission uh, going forward uh, to include you know, uh, natural disasters, hurricanes and whatnot, but also extreme weather events uh, like we've seen in Puerto Rico, but certainly pandemics are gonna have to re uh, we have to revision everything. Um, you know, in regards to VA, one of the things that mission really puts into to place is 
you got to maintain that strong VA presence because the surge capacity, the excess capacity in the private sector truly isn't there. And we see that now that as quick as the pandemic hit, the resources in the community quickly withdrew and VA had to centralize those resources, you know, case by case analysis to who could and couldn't get that care. And ultimately VA is the caretaker for all the veterans, even if on a routine basis they get local community care, the surge capacity isn't there in the private sector. VA is responsible, so it's got to stay strong. We're going to have to th surge capacity or excess capacity, whatever you call it. We're going to have to rethink in terms of uh, infrastructure, uh, asset review. Um, and I'm really pleased to see that the secretary is uh, aggressive about using his national emergency authority uh, to onboard more staff. Uh, he tells me we've, we've he's he's brought on ten thousand more people. Of course, I, I think you and I, uh, and all of the VSOs have been concerned about the forty to fifty thousand person vacancies. And and I I I know that we are going to chime together uh, to get to make sure that the secretary continues to hire more people. Uh, we have a chance to hire very high quality people. Uh, at the moment. And um, I, I want to make sure we put in place the policies that are going to make those people want to stay, uh, make, make it a career at the VA, uh, and that uh, we don't stop at 10,000, that we really try to, PVA was telling me about the, 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 the 1,000 nurses that uh, were determined to be needed at the spinal, uh, uh, the spinal injury uh, centers that they have. Uh, and I'm sure you, your organization, uh, has a bead on where we need more staff. Absolutely. When we talk about mental health care, need more staff. Women and veterans need more staff, not only more staff, but talented staff that have the skill sets to take care of our women and veteran cohort. There's lots of need out there. Yeah. Um, you know, um, uh, how are your members uh, who rely on caregivers or home services doing? What are you hearing uh, from caregivers? Uh, caregivers are already you know, struggling with enormous responsibilities and feelings of isolation. What support or services are available for them during this time? Well, you know, caregivers is a sensitive issue for, for DAV because it was a big piece of the Mission Act and those pieces never expanded, which means a whole generation from World War II all the way up to the Vietnam War aren't getting the services today that they should have if everything would have gone well and they would have expanded in October 2019. But having said that, for those who receive caregiver services, um, the actual personal protective equipment seems to be the largest challenge that we hear, that some of the routine daily maintenance activities is still a challenge. And if they've got third parties who access the home in order to provide those services, some of those challenges because of COVID-19 as well. Uh, we've made sure that the Undersecretary for Health is, is aware, or the executive in charge, if you will. And um, I think that's been a topic of every Wednesday's VSO call with the Secretary, that there's ongoing challenges, whether it be retired military or whether it be the caregivers themselves. Uh, PPE is a significant challenge for caregivers right now. Um, do your members tend to use like the aid and attendance um, like PVA folks do? Um, yes. And so um, I'm, I'm trying to work on some language in the next, we can talk about this when I talk about what you would like to see in the next CARES package, but um, it seems that one of the solutions is that we need to raise the uh, aid and attendance uh, uh, allowances uh, so that your members are able to hire uh, and contract out with people who uh, now have the added costs of PPE uh, that are going up. And, and I realize this issue predated uh, the pandemic uh, about having adequate, um, adequate resources to be able to contract out with the people you need to help take care of you, take, you know, take care of your members. Um, uh, we've learned some um, uh, early what, you know, what are some of the lessons that we've learned from this crisis uh, that the VA caregiver support program must consider 
uh, as they move forward with expansion? Well, I, I think probably the biggest piece when you when you think of caregivers, is these are, first of all, we got to put it in context, these are our most severely disabled veterans. And in the future, uh, you know, thankfully, the regulations that are forthcoming are going to also include illnesses in that regard. But this is a, of the most vulnerable population being veterans, one in five of those who are uh, dying due to COVID-19. This is the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable population. They all have serious underlying chronic health conditions. And it's the equivalent of being in a nursing home in every one of their houses. So we really have to make sure that we put them in the correct context that if we're gonna take care of those who are in the community living centers at VA, the nursing home, the next step is to make sure everybody that's getting those community care resources uh, are retracted back in and everybody getting the home caregiver services are all contained in that same bubble of protection. That's a really good point you're making there. I, I can totally get that the way you said it, um, that people uh, that are being taken care of at home and, the, and they're a caregiver program, uh, they're, we ought to think of them as sort of many community living centers and that what we do for the community living centers, we ought to be having that same mindset for these folks at home. That was, you're good at this. You're good at the advocacy, I like that. Uh, made it real clear for me. Uh, for your members who rely on the community care network, the CCNs out there, what are you hearing about their experiences since the crisis and lockdowns began? How does the role of community care need to modify in terms of national emergencies? Well, I don't think any of this was predictable. Um, so in, in large measure, we're seeing the same reaction across the country that if there was actual capacity that's there, of course, they're still doing the business of VA in where there wasn't for those doctors who were doing <laughs> A VA community care as a part of a network, they're following those network rules and those services have all been turned off except for, for emergency and urgent care. Again, VA being the fallback and they've retracted all care back to VA. Okay, um, I, I wanna take this moment where we're talking about CCNs and uh, that veterans who um, are not enrolled in the VA, during the time of this crisis, if you test positive for COVID-19 uh, and you start getting complications, you can receive health care on a humanitarian basis at the VA. So Absolutely. regardless of your income, regardless of your eligibility for VA care, uh, the VA is going to take care of you if you are a veteran uh, at, you know, it's, it's 170 plus medical centers across the country what you need to do is call 1-844-698-2311. That's 844-6666. I think I lost your uh, volume. Volume went out. Okay. Let's see. You're back. Back. Okay. Press 3 to be connected. So I want to give that number again, 844 698-2311. Also I want to add that uh, you uh, could be just have been discharged uh, with other than honorable discharge. Also, you're eligible during this national emergency. Um, Randy, I wanted to thank you for coming to the Women's Veterans Task Force uh, with your suggestions for contraception access and addressing intimate partner violence during this time. And for women veterans, uh, assessing gender specific care from VA was already a challenge. Uh, but now because of this public health emergency, uh, any kind of uh, preventative or routine care is, more, is now more difficult. Um, how do you see these disruptions to non-COVID care impacting women veterans in the long term? Well, you know, it's very difficult to, to say when it's going to end. Um, so while we've had some short-term disruption, the long-term consequences will be more significant, not only from the actual physical care of walk-in services, clinics that's available to all veterans, uh, but for women veterans in particular, unfortunately, they, they had some challenges in order to get the care, and then mental health overlays that go along with it. Uh, they have uh, comorbid risk factors for both mental health care as well as uh, some of the risk of being homeless. So women veterans is gonna be a significant challenge that we have to monitor 
it's as long as this crisis goes on. And when the crisis actually lifts, we gotta make sure that we don't leave them uh, behind when we start the reopening just because they're a minority of those served. Wonderful. Um, uh, well, you know, we're, we're, we have pending before us this, uh, the CARES 2 package. We, we passed CARES 1, we passed the CARES 1.5 to get more money to small businesses. Um, as we start to work on the negotiations for our next coronavirus package, that's known as CARES 2, what are the priorities for DAV uh, that you want to see in that package? Lost you sound. Um, we can you hear me? I can hear you now. So we we have three uh, priorities that we'd like to just uh, touch on and and bring to your attention. The, the first, of course, is you know when it comes down to uh, veterans and those with issues with finances, we'd like to see a part of that package be a mandate that debt management automatically under national emergency circumstances be suspended. So no debt collection occurs for that period of time plus 60 days. And there's a bill out there, HR 6590 right now, that for the most part puts this on the table. Uh, we'd like to see that move forward in the next package. In addition, under uh, CHAMP VA, uh, unlike the, under the Affordable Care Act where healthcare is automatically conveyed to the age of 26, under that program, you have to be a full-time student. So where there's interruptions of student status, they may have actually lost full-time student status. We don't want people to be temporarily kicked out or permanently kicked out of the CHAMP VA program. So we'd like for it to coincide with the Affordable Care Act. And if you've got CHAMP VA, that, that carries through to age 26, your healthcare purposes. Okay. Last, under national emergency uh, circumstances as a temporary but an ongoing uh, protocol, you know, for comprehensive health coverage of veterans, regardless of where they may be, we'd like to have VA automatically become the first party primary payer for health care. That would include emergency care, urgent care, and for ambulance services during that national emergency. So there's no quibbling or debating or trying to work out for a year or two after the fact who's paying the bill for veterans care. That's really interesting. I, I just want to check with Daniel. Did you get everything he said? Because uh, on my end, the sound went out a little bit when he was talking. Yeah, I was able to pick up, pick it up. Okay, great. Um, well, anything else that, that you want to add to that? Well, I, I think that as these packages come come through, um, you know, there's a lot of debate and deliberation about dollars and cents. And sometimes I think that veterans themselves, uh, they get deflated a bit because it doesn't appear that they were a priority. And I'll just give you an example. When the impact payments came out, there was a lot of automatic built-in legislative mandates of who got those payments automatically direct deposited. And it seemed like it was a protracted delay in order to get the administration on board to get automatic payments to VA beneficiaries. Uh, it'd be nice to have an emergency provision since we've got some lessons learned now so that we don't repeat that. In the future, if we need to have an automatic payment of any kind from the federal government, they should use the protocols and lessons learned here so that veterans are included in that package. Uh, that's really good. Uh, so there's, when we're in, a, we're, we're in a situation where we're slapping things together, uh, that we somehow preserve <laughs> uh, what happened here? I mean, you know, with people without veterans who don't file for their taxes, um, uh, how are they going to get that automatic payment? Um, and we still have an issue with uh, veterans that um, have uh, uh, five uh, the, the five hundred dollar per a dependent is an issue. So um, um, I I need to. Um, uh, bring this to a close. I wish we could I think we've lost your volume again. We've had work that uh, we've been able to do um, uh, together on veterans issues. And I want to thank um, all of your members 
for the leadership I know that they're exerting in their own communities uh, to help the country get through this moment. They know what sacrifice is. Uh, they know what it means to obey orders they don't especially like, but they know uh, that, you know, in the spirit of getting the job done, uh, we've got to get through this together. So uh, I know they're bringing a tremendous resource to the country, which is themselves. So thank you for uh, you and all your what your staff does on behalf of veterans. And um, you know, it's just an honor to work with y'all. Thank you, Chairman Takano. You know, DAV, we've been doing this. This year's our 100th anniversary. Um, bad time to have your centennial anniversary, but we are in this together. We'll be okay together. And if veterans need help, they can reach out to DAV. Let's go to DAV.org. We'll give them a hand. All right. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Chairman Takano, take care.